My uh, topic for this the uh, will be the final. This will be the final final discussion here for the uh, conference. And I'm going to be looking at the other side of the coin because in the last lecture just before lunch, I discussed Yeshua in context of Qumran and the Essenes. And you might have gotten the, the idea just from listening to that material alone that Yeshua was something of an, was essentially an Essene. That, uh, you know, that the entire movement was essentially an Essene movement. And that's not entirely true. There's a, another dimension to this that makes them very, very distinct from the Essenes and the Qumran community. And that is that Yeshua was also, much more profoundly, a teacher of the Pharisaic school of Hillel. <clears throat> In the first century, Pharisaic Judaism was not the united thing that it is now with absolutely no diversity. Okay? And without... You know, it wasn't the concept that there's. this is the only way to be Jewish, there isn't any other way to be Jewish. And so there were even various ways of being Pharisaic. Okay? There were two different way, two primary different ways to be Pharisaic or subsets. The school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. Now, the Talmud and the Mishnah are just filled with the conflicts between the two schools, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. It is said that the school of Shammai taught the spirit, I'm sorry, t taught the letter of the Torah, but the school of Hillel taught the spirit of the Torah. Okay? Shammai had the stricter interpretations, okay, where, you, where Hillel tended to have the more lenient interpretations of passages. Okay? They had different halakha, but they were tolerant of each other. According to the Mishnah, for example... You're not going to believe that this is odd, okay? But according to the Mishnah, even though they had different regulations of purity as to what would or would not make a dish become impure, there was a special rule in the Mishnah that said that a Pharisee of the school of Hillel, I'm sorry, of the school of Shammai, could still borrow utensils from a Pharisee of the school of, of, uh, of the other school. They could borrow dishes back and forth from each other without any questions asked, nor concerns about purity, even though their purity rules were different. And the Mishnah discusses that very point, that this was more or less an exception to their, their normal purity rules, was that they could still borrow dishes from each other. So there was still this sense of unity among them, but there were, fair, there were these two conflicting schools. Now, eventually, the school of Hillel prevailed. Although it's recognized in rabbinic Judaism that the that the uh, uh, the halacha of the school of Hillel is for this world, and the halacha of the school of Shammai is for the stricter halacha is for the world to come. Now I want to outline three important parallels, very important parallels between Yeshua and the Pharisaic school of Hillel. The first one is love. The teaching of love. Hillel was the flower child of the first century. <laughs> okay? He taught love. He would have been, you know, just comfortable in the 60s. <laughs> okay. This is what uh, Hillel taught. Now, let me back up a minute because we talked about the Qumran community. Now, the Qumran community, what did they teach? Hate. Never in the history of literature, with the probable exception of anti-Semitic literature, will you find uh, a uh, more hateful term terms and even outright requirements within their halakha to hate people. Okay? Let me quote, this is a good example. The perfect example is their interpretation of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18 says, 
You shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of my people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. That's what it says. Okay. Now, how do I interpret this? How do I understand it? Okay. Well, by the way, I bet you all thought that was a New Testament phrase. That's uh, Leviticus. Okay. This is how the Qumran community understood the passage. This is from the Damascus document, column 9, line 2. As for the passage that says, Take no vengeance and bear no grudge against your kinfolk, any covenant member who brings against his fellow an accusation not sworn to before witnesses or who makes an accusation in the heat of anger, who tells it to his elders to bring this fellow into rebuke, the same is a vengeance taker and a grudge bearer. Notice the careful qualification there. Any covenant member. In other words, anybody in our community. That's how they applied that passage. Okay? This is how they viewed those that were outside their community. Quoting from the Manual of Discipline, uh, column 9, lines 21 through 26. Bear unremittent hatred towards all men of ill repute to leave it to them to pursue wealth and mercenary gain truckling to a depot. In other words, going to their own end. That was the attitude. We just hate those people. You are commanded to hate them and let them continue on in their sin going their own way to an end and you know we can't wait to see it happen. Now this is by contrast, what Hillel taught. These are the words of Hillel. Be disciples of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace, loving people and drawing them near to Torah. That's from the Mishnah of Volt 112. Very, very important. Very big distinction. Okay? Because if you're drawing some people close to Torah, are they a covenant member? No. Exactly. So Hillel said, love these people, drawing them close to Torah. Okay? Now, by contrast, the Qumran community says, hate those people and let them go their own way. You see the contrast here? And by its very nature, therefore, Hillel and the Pharisees of the time period were evangelical, as we call it today. They had the desire to bring people to Torah. The Qumran community had absolutely no desire whatsoever. Now, Yeshua followed in the same line. Yeshua taught this. You have, this is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 47. And I believe here that he seems to be referring to the Qumran community as he speaks. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? So he starts by quoting this passage, love your neighbor. And then he gives the Qumran corollary to that, hate your enemy. Okay? But he differs with the hate your enemy idea in favor of the school of Hillel concept of love these people, draw them near to Torah. And he does this by applying in defining the term neighbor with offense. 
you don't know who your neighbor might be. So you better just love everybody and make sure. Okay? Now, Yeshua illustrates this with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember that? And the, that's how he, the, the agotic example he uses to explain who your neighbor may or may not be. Now I'm going to dwell on this point for just a second here. Because we in this, you know, in this Torah observant movement and with the exhilaration that we, you know, zealous for Torah as we are, just as they were in Acts chapter 21, I dare say here at the conference you would probably say that, see that say that you probably haven't seen a more a group more zealous for the Torah than we are here. Okay? There is the natural tendency to get hateful and spiteful and to the outsider, to those that aren't keeping Torah. Whereas we have a message, and we want to be very clear about not compromising on that message, and where we stand, on the one hand, on the other hand, drawing those people to Torah means loving them and drawing them close to Torah. A natural result of that, of course, is the desire to bring Torah to them, as Hillel says, drawing them close to Torah. If you love these people, you're going to want to give them what you have. And what we have to give them is Torah. And so, on the, on the, on the one hand, uh, it's important to love these people in order to bring them Torah. We can't love them to the extent of giving up Torah <laughs> because then we have nothing left to give and we're not drawing them close to Torah. We have to be very clear on, on our stand on the observance of Torah and its significance. The next parallel between Yeshua and the school of Hillel is the golden rule. According to the, this is a, a story from the Talmud here. Many of you have probably heard it, but I, I'm going to quote it directly from the Talmud, from Babylonian Talmud Shabbat 31a. It happened that a certain heathen came before Shammai and said to him, Make me a proselyte on condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. Thereupon he repulsed him with the builder's cubit, which was in his hand. Took this, just beat him over the head with a stick and made him run off. Okay? This Shammai was known as a hothead with a bad temper. When he went before Hillel, he said to him, in other words, Hillel answered, Do not to others what you would not have them do to you. That is the whole Torah, while the rest is the commentary thereof. Go and learn it. Where have you heard something like that before? Very, very similar. Okay? Similar incident occurs in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 33 through 40, equals Mark 12, 28 through 31, equals Luke 10, 35 through 37. Here, Yeshua is uh, pressed to summarize the Torah. I'll go ahead and read the story. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, now what had just happened here in the storyline was that some Sadducees tried to trick him up and uh, he responded to them in such a way that shut them up. Okay? just to give you the setting. And so when this happens, a Pharisee that hears him says, aha, maybe this guy is going to be a, you know, this guy is great. This guy is really good. Maybe he's going, you know, he shut up the Sadducees. Let's see where he stands. Maybe he's going to be a good apologist for our school of Hillel Pharisaic position. And so he goes to him. He says, but when the Pharisees heard that he silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the Torah? And Yeshua said, You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law 
and the prophets. In the storyline, by the way, it's very important to realize if you have to go look at uh, uh, the story in all three of the synoptics to, to get the whole gist of what goes on here, the, uh, the Pharisee that he's speaking with agrees with him. Okay? And I'm going to come to that in just a moment. Well, let me see here. The Pharisee goes on to say that this is true. He agrees with him and then says that uh, loving your neighbor is greater than all the burnt offerings. Referencing Hosea 6, chapter 6, verse 6. And we're going to look at the significance of that in just a minute. But that was very significant to the, another parallel between Yeshua and Hillel overall. So he agrees with him. The next thing that happens in this story, by the way, uh, and you have to look in all three of the synoptics to get the whole story, but what happens in the story next is that Yeshua then turns around and says to them, puts them on the spot, and he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Come sit at my right hand. Who is the other Lord here? And they didn't know and they went away. Well, he was introducing an apocalyptic element to them that was very familiar to the Qumran community. In 11, a document they had, 11Q13, I'm kind of trace, chasing a tangent here, but I've got to throw it in since it's in this, it fits to the storyline. Uh, in 11Q13, which was one of the documents from Qumran, they recognized the Melchizedek figure in Psalm 110 as being synonymous with Yahweh. We talked about that in the uh, Deity of the Messiah uh, discussion. And they quoted... Uh, um, Isaiah chapter 61, the first few verses, and instead of saying the year of Yahweh's favor, they said in the year of Melchizedek's favor. Okay? And they also, in that document, referred to Melchizedek as El and Elohim. So, there, uh, uh, there, the Qumran community had this recognition that this other individual was this very special messianic individual, this other Lord in Psalm 110. So Yeshua then, when he comes back to these Pharisees, he turns around and he quotes Psalm 110. Well, the Pharisees weren't into apocalyptic literature. In fact, there's a, there's a book out somebody was asking me about Hillel and Jesus. Okay, One of the points of the book is that it shows the great contrast between Hillel and Jesus uh, was that Hillel was not even a little bit apocalyptic. He had you know, no apocalyptic elements in his teachings whatsoever. It was strictly halakhic. So uh, uh, by contrast, of course, the Qumran community were, were very wrapped up in apocalyptic ideas. And Yeshua had some apocalyptic ideas, and he was kind of introducing that here. All right, the third parallel that's most important is chesed. Which could be love, but here we're talking about chesed, potentially, especially in the sense of grace. Rabbinic literature records over 350 disputes between the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. And the nature of these disputes, Hillel almost always takes the lenient position, and Shammai almost always takes the strict, stricter position. According to the Zohar, the school of Shammai was based on Gevarah, or severity, while the school of Hillel was based on Chesed, grace. Now you remember, we, uh, when we did the uh, uh, Kabbalah study yesterday, and we did the, the Tree of Life and the Adam Kadamah, you saw that on the one hand you had grace and on the other hand you had severity and that they were two opposing attributes of God that were um, equal but opposite balancing factors, if you will. Okay, And the understanding that the Kabbalists had was that Hillel's halacha was rooted in chesed okay? and the Shammai's was rooted in severity. <clears throat> That brings us back to the passage we were talking about when Yeshua gives his summary 
of the Torah in that uh, uh, discussion. He says, and to lo- uh, the Pharisee that's speaking to him in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, after he agrees with Yeshua, he says, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, which is referring to Hosea 6.6. 6. So the Pharisee is saying this. Remember, it's important to realize who the speaker is. This is not Yeshua. This is the Pharisee adding to what Yeshua said. So he's giving us a Pharisaic idea here that uh, that he found himself agreed with what Yeshua was saying. The passage is Hosea 6, 6, For I desire mercy, or chesed, and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of Elohim more than burnt offerings. This was an important basis for Yeshua's halacha. Let me look in. Let's look together in Matthew chapter 12. Mark. Matthew. We're moving to Matthew. We're looking now at Matthew chapter 12. This is where Yeshua has a great deal of information about Yeshua's halakhic positions regarding the Shabbat. I'll start in verse 3. Um, well, let me... Let me just summarize the story and then I'll go into it. We're familiar with the story. Yeshua and his followers are uh, uh, eating some uh, uh, wheat. It says corn in the King James Version, but of course corn is an American grain that was wheat or barley. And they were uh, um, rubbing this between their hands and getting the wheat out, which would normally have been a violation of Shabbat, according to the to the the normal rules. And so he says, have you not read what David did when he was hungered and uh, and them that were with him? He entered into the house of God and did eat showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. He starts to give some examples for, for his halakhic case here. First he says, when, you know, that David ate the showbread that was normally only allowed to be eaten by the priests. And then he says, if you're not read in the, in the Torah, how on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? In other words, the sacrifices and offerings are performed on the Sabbath as well as circumcisions, which otherwise you know, would seem to be a Sabbath violation. But I say to you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means... I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Shabbat. Let me give an uh, understanding of what he's talking about here. We have an understanding in Judaism of a priority of commandments. I gave the illustration yesterday, for example, the person on the ship Somebody's down in the water drowning and they're saying, help me, help me, save me, I'm drowning. And I see them and I take, I turn around and there's a uh, lifesaver. I, I start to grab hold of this lifesaver to throw it to them to save their life. And somebody runs up to me and says, ah, you can't have that. I own the boat. This is mine. You cannot have it. What do I do? Do I say, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I cannot steal. You have to die. No, because the the commandment thou shalt not kill overrides the commandment thou shalt not steal and I would be effectively killing this man. Okay. So, there's this priority of commandments. And Hosea 6.6 is speaking of the priority of commandments in an idiomatic way. It is not saying that God did not ask for sacrifices. Otherwise, the Bible is self-contradictory. Go look in Leviticus. You know, because then we have to look at God and say, well, can you get your story straight, please? (laughs) What it is saying is that he desires mercy more than sacrifice. Okay? And he desire, or chesed, let's use that key word, chesed, which also means grace, by the way, or mercy, more than sacrifice. And that he, uh, the knowledge of Elohim, more than burnt offerings. Now, that seems like an arbitrary statement at first, but this is a key passage 
for developing a Nazarene halacha. Very key passage because it assigns halachic weight to chesed. And it assigns it in a very known way. And that very known way is because it mentions the sacrifices and the burnt offerings, the halachic weight of which is well established and very high. Because we know that the sacrifices and the burnt offerings are of such great halachic weight that they override the the Sabbath itself. Do you follow? So, he says, since according to Hosea, chesed is of greater weight than the sacrifices. And we already know that the sacrifices are of greater weight than the Shabbat. The chesed overrides the Shabbat. Does that make sense? Good halakhic reasoning here. Okay? So this was Yeshua's uh, understanding. By the way, this is also using the first rule of Hillel. You see how these things build? How, how much progression we're going to make as we go along as the months and years go by? And we start applying the seven rules of Hillel because this is a matter of comparing light and heavy. And we also can apply the principle of Dio and say that it has to be something of at least of greater weight as the, th- the examples we have in the New Testament. We've got, by the way, the Beit Din has a beautiful Shabbat halacha worked out, all based on these principles that we're talking about. Oh, okay. Now let's get back. Yeshua's Halacha was largely based on this concept in Hosea 6.6 6 that assigns halachic weight to chesed. And the Pharisee that he was debating with, not debating with yet at that point in time, the Pharisee that agreed with him, not only agreed with him, but then himself cited Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, and this concept, this passage that assigns halachic weight to chesed. And then we read in the Zohar years later that the understanding of the rabbis years later is that the school of Shammai taught severity and the school of Hillel taught chesed. So Yeshua was a teacher of the school of Hillel. His halacha was rooted in chesed, just like Hillel. Okay. So, to summarize... The three pillars, if you will, that hold up the edifice that uh, uh, Yeshua that, that tie Yeshua strongly into the school of Hillel are love, the golden rule. By the way, I, I did forget to mention there are other passages in which Yeshua makes a statement almost identical to Hillel's, in which he says, "Do unto others as you would have them do to you," and y'all are all aware of that, I'm sure. And then, chesed. His halacha was rooted in chesed. And there is very real application of this to us as modern Nazarenes. All three of these things. One, drawing people close to Torah with love. Very important. Two, The golden rule of treating other people, I mean, that's always important. Treating other people the way you would have them treat you. And finally, our halakha should be rooted in chesed. And Yeshua gives us a beautiful guideline for doing that in Matthew 12 by recognizing the halakhic authority of chesed in relationship to known halachic weights uh, for such things as the sacrifice and the Sabbath. So Yeshua was a teacher of the school of Hillel, as well as having these other factors from Qumran that factor into his understandings. I will now open for questions. I only went half an hour. This is great. I don't know how much how I covered all that in half an hour. I wasn't watching the time. Anyway, we have plenty of time for questions and then maybe more time to socialize afterwards since the conference is over after this. Questions? Comments? No questions. Everybody got all that. Yes? Oh, 
I'm sorry, since who? Tom Kaplan. They wouldn't say Islamic State together. No. I don't know if you... Did you catch my lecture before lunch? No. Yochanan was probably raised in the Qumran community out in the wilderness. Yeshua very well may have uh, studied at the school of Hillel if, uh, um, if he had any formal training at all. Um, there is a story where Yeshua is t uh, teaching... Uh, remember that when he's young, they come back to the temple, he's uh, 12 years old, and he's teaching at the temple, and the leaders at the temple are just amazed at, at, at his teaching. Well, the, 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 the teachers of the time period would likely have been Hillel and Shammai. Okay? And there's an interesting... I have to throw this in here, too, because it kind of fits into the, this event. There, how many people have heard of a document called the Toldot Yeshu? Okay? It's a terrible document that never should have been written. Okay, I first have to say that. It's a rabbinical parody on the gospel story that is extremely hostile and tells about how Mary becomes impregnated by a Roman soldier and, and how he pretends to be the Messiah and, and uh, how he uses the sacred name to heal people and, and uh, um, how he uses deception to learn the sacred name from the hierarchy at the through the temp from the temple. It's a long story. It's really bizarre. But, and it, 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 but there's a theory in textual criticism that says since it's a hostile parody on the gospel, that it actually has its roots in a gospel document that they then altered and, and wrote this parody into. And there is an event that happens in the Toldot Yeshu that you have to wonder, well, why is this in the storyline? Because it's favorable information. It's not negative. There's a story that parallels this event where Yeshua is uh, a young man, a child, uh, I say, you know, 12, say 12 years old, probably the same event Luke is talking about. And there's some great rabbis that are debating halakha. It doesn't say exactly what issue they're debating, only that they were debating halakha and Yeshua uh, and uh, Yeshua interjects an opinion to them. Well, you can imagine how uh, how <laughs> how it was taken, okay? And they said, "Do you not know that the servant something effective that the that the that the lesser is silent and listens to instruction from his master only, and that the master does not learn from the from from the from the student?" And Yeshua wisely answered him and said, Was not Moshe greater than Jonathan? I'm not, I'm not Jonathan. Uh, Jethro? Was not Moses greater than Jethro? But did not Jethro come and give him instruction? And he did he not receive it well? <laughs> so, and I, you know, I can't figure out why that would be in the told out Yeshua. Uh, as part of the hostile parody, because it's you know it's it's a, a beautiful word of wisdom, you know. Okay, is there any more or one more? Oh, two more. I'm sorry. Um, which Gamaliel? Gamaliel one. Okay. Um, what, third, uh, 40 years? So I'm just guesstimating. Yeah, his grandson. Yeah, Hillel taught when Yeshua was a child. And dates on some of this stuff are pretty rough. Okay? Question? So, uh, believing now that Yeshua uh, had a lot of people. Okay, I don't want it to, to take away from any of that. I'm just saying that there is no, that it is to be expected to see Yeshua teaching within a Jewish context, within the context of Judaism that already existed. In fact, 
What I find in that is not, oh, well, was he just borrowing a little of this and a little of that and smacking it together and creating a Essene Pharisee sandwich. And I say, no, there's more to it than that. But when we see these things did already exist in the first century when Yeshua came along, what we find is continuity. We find that there are roots in this thing, that Yeshua wasn't this guy that came from nowhere teaching something radically new, but rather that Yeshua came into uh, Judaism of the first century teaching Judaism of the first century. And that Judaism of the first century, there's a continuity historically. And this, this answer is, I don't know if he's still here, but the gentleman that was concerned yesterday about, you know, Judaism, you know. Um, remember the guy that was talking yesterday, well, uh, what's so important about Judaism, you know. Well, Judaism is what the New Testament actually calls the religion of the time period. You can, it's in Galatians, Paul says that he was, you know, an expert in Judaism, okay. So historically we know that it was called Judaism in the first century. And we can trace the roots of, and the continuity of what Yeshua is teaching. And well, here it is in the school of Hillel, and here it is in the Qumran manuscripts. So it was Judaism. So now it's valid to say, yes, Yeshua came to be a t- teacher of Judaism and not to dispose of Judaism in favor of a new religion. And it is valid to call that Ju- religion Judaism because if it wasn't, Certainly, if it was important, particularly important not to call our religion Judaism, since it was being called that in the first century, surely Yeshua would have said, by the way, guys, you shouldn't call this Judaism. <laughs> he never said that. So are we ready to, to, to break and just socialize? Wonderful. It's been a wonderful conference, and it's really been pleasing having you to